Morning all. I'd like to go over the over the ball game on Thursday night. It was against John Quinn, an away match against Ealing Chess Club in Middlesex League. They actually won the Middlesex League half a point, um, half a match point ahead of Hendon One uh, to win Division One last year. Um, I don't usually play in in all the away matches, and uh, but this one was a key one, I think. So I was on board free, and I played. Um, E4. I, I've played John Quinn at least twice before. I think I've beaten him once and it might have been a draw the other game or I might have even lost. I'm not, I'm not completely sure of that first encounter but I knew he was like a dangerous uh, player anyway and uh, quite resourceful. So um, he played C5 and I tried to play for the Morris Smith Gambit so I played D4 I think he played the most fashionable response to this, which is not to accept it, uh, but to play instead um, knight f6. So it's sort of transposing into c3 Sicilian theory now, after e5, knight d5. It looks like a c3 Sicilian type position. I play knight f3, and um, now he undermines e5 a little bit with d6. So there's a big question what to do here um, to try and get an advantage. Uh, now from a recent blitz game actually one, one or two of you commented about the bishop um, move that I played. I think I played here and it was wrong because it allowed at some point knight b4 when the, there wasn't a pawn on c3. I was sort of wary about that, that um, if this bishop sometimes it might have to go like this to point at the king side. I played here bishop c4 but other alternatives from engine analysis to this, this position, queen d4 might be okay. Uh, say d takes, bishop b5. This might be an interesting position to play with a small advantage for white. But it's without queens, it's not that much fun, I guess. But it's a small advantage. Um, but uh, so queen d4 and um, after d takes, there's also say e6 as well. Um, knight d2. This line doesn't look too hot for white, to be honest, with the queens off like this. Looks as though black's equal. So it's sometimes a bit tricky to get, I think, an advantage here uh, from this. Um, white's temporarily a pawn down, and black's undermining the center. After d takes, there is an opportunity, though, to. Um, to play knight takes e5, it's not losing a piece or anything because, well, at the moment d5 is under fire anyway. But say queen c7, bishop d5 is not right, I think, because check, losing a piece. But here queen d4 would be possible to protect both. So, um, he played actually e6, and I was glad about this bishop being locked in now. So, I just castle here. Actually, and after knight b3, bishop b3, and then he challenges that knight on e5. Of course, he doesn't want to take here, that would be a disaster. Check, knight f7, winning. So, um, he plays uh, knight 8 d7, and probably a weak move now by me. I shouldn't really have weakened my position like this. Uh, probably most sensible is. Um, in this position, I played f4, but probably most sensible is, is maybe cd and allow even the exchange of queens because it might be a small advantage for white. Let's see, let's just get an engine evaluation here just to make sure. This position, T tiny advantage for white, bishop d7, knight c 3 uh, They said maybe f4 and bishop e3. Okay, so that's probably uh, that, that would have been okay, a bit cramping that pawn. And if, if I've got natural development like this, I can eye things like c5 and maybe knight e4 later. And f4 is needed. But um, f4 here is a bit loosening. And he's able to simplify that. Maybe this is not the best what he played, actually. Uh, maybe just um, there's, there's better moves. He played knight c5. Um, anyway, so. But we'll go with this. I play bishop c2 and he simplifies with d3. But I, I end up with a small advantage again, I think, 
in this position is not too bad. Although the bishop's temporarily locked in, you know, that is potentially a dangerous pawn. Uh, he tries, he does, he's in no rush to castle on the king's side though. He plays actually just bishop d7. I sort of envisaged he might try this sort of thing. He's, he can exploit the fact that the knight's not here to park his queen aggressively. And then maybe even try for an attack in castle queen side. <laughs> it's quite ambitious. But uh, that's the gist of it now. So queen e2 check. Queen h4 did indeed happen. So I kick the bishop with b4 because I want to actually discourage casting queenside. I want to be able to play stuff like this and undermine a6 with a6 maybe. Um, so bishop e4 also against bishop c6 and he played it anyway accepting some structural damage. So I take, I think I'm slightly better again. I risk weakening some light squares here. I play g3, Parks as queen on h3. We've got a situation here. I've got a lot of pawn moves here. Um, I've got potential light square weaknesses, but are they exploitable? He's got nice use of d5 potentially. He's got also use of the d file potentially. And he's also, if I'm not careful, going to hack me up to bits. Um, from from the white point of view, though, I've got the semi-open foal here. So any move like knight d2 to e4 be difficult to play f5 because of that semi-open file. So that that might give me a good game. And also control of c5 is good with bishop e3 and I can highlight c5. So swings and roundabouts here. I play knight d2 and I think I'm slightly better now after knight e4. Bishop e3, my rooks are now connected. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. How are you doing? Okay, so the rooks are connected there. Rook a d8 though. And the problem I have here, pointing things at the Black King, is Petrosian-like exchange sacks, which might be possible for Black now, uh, to neutralize pressure at just the right moment. It's not that easy to trap the Queen, it seems. I tried to work out, how can I trap this Queen? Uh, so things started occurring to me already about trapping the Queen here. But first I fought Bishop d4. Now, after rook d5, he might even be outrageously trying to play rook h5. And here I is the the echo of trying to trap the queen. I played g4, and I think white is slightly better now because rook f3. And if he took here, then the other one comes, and g7 is a disaster. But we're heading here for a Petrosian-like exchange sack to neutralize and and strengthen the black king's safety. The major thing pointing at the black king is this this bishop on d4. He's about to knock that out after rook f3, queen h4. Uh, this is getting to be a very critical position for, for maintaining an advantage, by the way. And in fact, I might have already done an inaccuracy with rook f3. Of course, g takes needs to be considered here, even though it weakens um, the pawns. And an engine might, might even indicate that um, g takes is the best move. It doesn't so far. It's it's going with rook f3 here actually. That tempo gaining move rook f3. So I don't think I've slipped up the attack. But look at the advantage in theory. It seems quite good in theory. In fact, after rook f3, almost a pawn. So there is something to Black's queen's placement. Queen h4. And here, uh, if we look at this position, it looks as though I should be better here. One could argue anyway. The, these pawns are both restrained, so Black's um, play in the centre is a bit limited. Bishop's pointing at the king. G file looks promising dynamically. So I've got seemingly some important dynamic trump cards going on here. But how to actually win this concretely? I thought that G5 looks looks promising. But it's it's still worth investigating structural damage possibilities because um, if you have the advantage or and you want to try and get to the opponent's king, then I think there's a whole range of um, dynamic options that become available. Available, obviously, sacrificing all your bits, positional sacrifices. So those are sacrifices with uh, the context of the pawn structure, etc. Um, losing pawns generally, um, forcing moves. 
I've used up one forcing move, of course, rook f3. Um, but the other option is also structural damage to be considered at all points uh, for pressure, because structural damage here, okay, isolates these pawns, but the g file pressure could be emphasized. And again, it might be the best move to accept some structural damage by playing g takes h5. If we add a bit to here and check that again, is g takes h5 a strong move? Actually, it's not giving. Ah, now you see you see that with brute force, it's, it's arriving at the conclusion that g takes h5 might actually be the best. Not not really caring about the isolated pawns, looking deeper into the position. Um, so let's go with a variation I stored earlier here. Actually, so g takes h5. Why would this be a very strong move? Okay, we're accepting structural damage, but we really want to get at the black king. So rook g1 here. Okay, so say f6. Which seems to neutralize f6 because it's supported by e7, f8, and the queen. It seems to neutralize and soak up the pressure. But of course, it weakens e6. So knight c5, let's go with this. Bishop c5, bishop c5. And black is basically sacrificing e6 here. Um, and it looks as though this could be. And that shall decoy positional sack here. If I play queen e6, isn't the queen misplaced? I'm going to have to come back to defend h2. And that could be unpleasant. Um, together with the fact that also knight d5 is now going to hit an isolated pawn. So this is the problem. It, it looks a bit silly, this continuation. Uh, and here it seems actually, you know, the story's gone away from the g file here. Or has it? Rook fg3, what is the defensive resource? Rook h7. And I'm still left with these fractured pawns. So this is a very controversial option, this idea of, of weakening the pawns, because there could be dynamics for black or interesting resources, which do indeed emphasize the structural damage is not just visual, it's actual. So how could white possibly be better here with the g-file pressure in exchange for the fractured pawns? Well, let's see bishop d6. Let's go with this, attacking the rook. Now queen g2, so a concrete threat on g7. And now why wouldn't queen h6 work? Why is g5 being suggested? Because rook g6, and that would be splat for g7. So it shows here, if you have maybe an attacking position, maybe a generalization to make is... Uh, to be open-minded, to consider all options, the longer the time limit, uh, you can consider all options, even options which seem a bit ugly for pawn structure. I, I really, so this is a point of some regret maybe that I didn't investigate G takes uh, more fully. Um, see some of these, two of these engine lines. Uh, let's, let's give another idea. Let's try an exchange sack here, in fact, rook takes D4. Like D5 Petrosian style. Now here, I, I think what I have to be careful, a move like this, just allowing knight f4 might not be the best. Although again, you know, it seems maybe the g-file pressure rebounds with a vengeance. Knight g4, protecting h2, maybe going in for the attack soon. So what is the concrete threat here? It's rook h3, and then maybe rook takes h5. And to here, uh, black, if black's forced to lose a piece, then that, that's really bad. So it's it's natural, it seems, um, and I haven't mentioned this maybe explicitly in, in Blitz videos, that in a promising um, attacking position, what do we have? We have sacrifices available. And we could even sacrifice our pawn structure, in effect. Maybe that's just an instance of a sacrifice, sacrificing pawn structure. If it gives you loads of pressure and tactical possibilities, it's well worth investigating. I chose a more cautious option, um, g5, but it does allow this uh, positional exchange sack. Rook takes d4. So he's knocked out one attacking piece. Because otherwise, I'm just playing knight f2, potentially. Um, or, or protecting f1 and playing uh, knight f2 and even rook h3 to try and trap the queen. 
So he has to do something. So this exchange sack is quite interesting. Knight d5. The knight's a bit of a monster on d5. In front of an isolated pawn, hitting pawns here. So he's going to get a pawn for the exchange, it seems. So I protect that one. And the queen, it's, it's, it's difficult to try and uh, win it here. So I found I was, I was struggling now with this position. So I've blown, really, by playing g5, I've blown my chance for concrete g-file pressure. So again, this this is a very important attacking example. I, you know, if we can learn from our mistakes. I, I'm I think the key thing is to become more open-minded when you've got a good position for how to further that position. I think that's the key thing. If, if you want, would like to comment on that, that would be much appreciated that you've got to keep all your options open when you've got the advantage because it's justified sometimes structural damage if you're going to make or or win with pressure on g7 it's worth it it's it's worth looking at this position in detail after g takes h5 um, also rook rook g3 a brief mention of rook g3 I don't think this quite works out um, say g6 but it might do because um, the structural damage here, you know, where is the pressure? Where is it leading? At some point, it seems black might crack. Though you have this idea that there's going to be a move, and it's increasing white's advantage because the pressure seems to be intensifying on that g5. If I'm winning the exchange here, and the whites uh, getting a lot better. And here, look, 1.61. So th there's a pressure mounting here. And so that definitely needed to be investigated. So that's my big regret for this game, that I thought I was going to cruise through with g5, and I underestimated, or didn't even really consider rook takes d4. So he's got this position now, just um, an exchange in a pawn, uh, exchange down for a pawn. Um, but this bishop has also got, if we look at this position, a lot of dark square pawn targets. So in principle, the exchange sacrifice is theoretically grounded because uh, this bishop is very valuable in this position. But anyway, here I, I find a way uh, which I thought to, to increase the advantage with ch a check and, a, and instead of g takes for queen f6, I now attack the queen. So a bit of docking agent, docking computer analysis here for, for finding the recent Zug move, rook h3, making sure this isn't a disaster that he has to play queen g4 and I'm basically the exchange up for a pawn but now he leaves all my pawns on dark squares and puts all his pawns on light squares which is quite nasty because this bishop has got various options uh, to attack bits and pieces here pawns, poor pawns uh, so this is not so clear this position I've got a target on c6 which I probe and there's a lot of manoeuvring now, so I'm going to be two pawns for the exchange, two pawns for the exchange. So I can't really be claiming uh, to be that much better, but I'm going to get the one pawn back, so it's one pawn for the exchange. Unfortunately, the rook's kind of active and annoying, so I have to be very careful now um, with all these moves, because also I don't want to allow uh, an embarrassing g5 as well. Here I had to check for possibilities like g5 all the time as well. And eventually I thought, okay, I'm driving this rook back now. I'm sealing um, against rook c3. And he plays h4. And that that's kind of useful as well for future endgames because this pawn's going to be a quick runner if this pawn ever got knocked out. So it's actually a difficult to win position here. He's set up a kind of fortress. Iron, was it Iron Tigran? Maybe for a reason because his position's made of iron. Um, I suppose being made of steel is better, but if we look at this position, so the the Trig Tigan Petrosian exchange sack has, has left him with a solid position, although it's like half a pawn, it's in theory, but uh, it's difficult to win this. I play h3 because I I want to, I don't want a pawn fixed on a dark square. Another thing for this uh, this dark square bishop to pick up later, like a vulture. Uh, so rook c c2. Rook c6, and I thought I was gradually making an inroad here to win a7. But of course that bishop's going to be a hero. 
And I thought, okay, this reminds me of the five minute game I played on the ACC earlier. If I can sacrifice back the exchange for the outside pass pawn, I think it was approaching time pressure. I didn't even see rook d5 at this point, and that was kind of annoying because now my rook is actually trapped. Whoops, on a6, so I'm actually virtually forced if I'm trying to win this to sack the exchange back. So I've got this outside pass pawn. And he plays beautifully, he plays g5, and it's really dangerous for this pawn now, because, you know, oh, what am I doing with this pawn? His rook's now getting very active to play rook g3. Um, and here, it seems as though my best move was rook b3, and maybe I'll be getting an advantage, but it's no big deal. Rook b3, he just plays king e7. He can leave this, of course I can't take, because he'll be queening that, and I can't play a5 here. If I play a5 here, the king comes to the rescue just in time. It's coming into that square and now I think he takes here timely taking for king c6. The king's in the square of the queening and it's equal, dead equal. So that's a very tricky position. Um, my, my friend Alex thought, or other people thought rook b3 might be winning here. If this is the exact position we had, then it's it's clearly not. And I went uh, with this move, a5, which is no good, of course. He's creating a dangerous pass pawn. And um, I think I played a6 and off with the draw, and he might have... I think it was this position he might have accepted generously, because he felt he was losing the whole game. And he was, we were both down to two minutes, but he's clearly got the chances now. Uh, black's better, finally. If we look at engine evaluation, black's definitely better by about half a pawn. So it was a really intense game where I think the key lesson is this idea of being open-minded. If you get this advantageous position, how do you further exploit the advantage? Um, we've got the idea of looking for sacrifices, uh, but also sacrificing pawn structure, you know, as well as forcing moves. All play a role sometimes in trying to increase uh, an attacking advantage and it seems I missed out on, on, on being able to intensify the pressure by, by sacrificing pawn structure. O often you compromise pawn structure to get isolated pawns or ugly pawns to, to increase pressure of the pieces. Uh, that's a natural sort of um, balance in chess structure for pressure. Uh, so getting a nice attacking position it was a bit disappointing because there's also this factor of the queen almost being trapped. It was a little bit disappointing that this cheeky move h5 uh, was able to be used. If he didn't play that, um, it would be, you know, potentially easy to sort of mount up pressure with rook f3, rook g1, and maybe queen g2 and rook h3. And I was looking forward to that. But this 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 move is is positionally motivated. Look at black putting pawns on light squares and trying to fix these pawns on dark squares uh, for for a potentially menacing exchange that getting rid of my attacking piece and leaving a dark square bishop hero in the position. So here is the critical moment. G takes h5, seemingly inviting also rook h5, which doesn't seem that pleasant as well with black having the more compact pawn structure, but it's the g file which is very important. It's difficult to balance and understand these things sometimes, but um, this is just asking for an exchange check to really celebrate this bishop and my pawns now being fixed on dark squares. So this is what happened, and that monster knight on d5 also is a bit unpleasant. So knight f6, a, a tactical blow to at least get rid of the monster knight and um, and he plays a very good move now, g6. Of course, he's, he's going to get crushed if he plays g takes. I take it and take the bishop and maybe mating the king almost or winning the rook. But once I move the king. Um, so this move leaves things nearly in balance. And it was just difficult to make it inroad, really. Um, I checked the accuracy of this game at chess post and it was very very accurate for both sides actually. So it was a difficult, uh, he's a difficult guy to beat and he played very well on the defence. So my only, my only slight regret is this um, 
not being more open minded so I'm hoping in future games when I have a promising attacking position you know not just consider sacrifices sacrificing pawns queens whatever but structural damage is a, is a key weapon as well as forcing moves you know the docking computer concept these are all key weapons to try and increase an advantage from a promising position of course before that to build up the promising position you know you need good position play you need to centralize your pieces etc all of that but once you get a promising position um, this increase in dynamism dynamic for opening up the possibilities is important I think otherwise um, the opponent can uh, get away from a seemingly dangerous position as in this game comments or questions on YouTube thanks very much